to welcome Christian Plessy um, to this keynote hour. Christian is a reader in the Department of Sociology at Manchester Metropolitan University and is co-lead of the research group Contemporary Intimacies, Genders and Sexualities. Um, Christian has done extensive research into LGBTQI plus intimacies, cultures and intro politics and has a particular interest in bisexualities and consensual non-monogamies. His work is interdisciplinary and often collaborative and he's the author of the amazing book, The Spectre of Promiscuity, Gay Male and Bisexual Non-Monogamies and Polyamories, which came out in 2007. Um, his more recent work on bisexuality includes the articles on the government of bisexual bodies, um, asylum case law and the biopolitics of bisexual erasure and by feminist anti, anti I can't speak at this point in the day, I apologize everyone, anti-monogamy and the politics of erotic autonomy. Um, which came out in 2022. And today I'm just going to be asking Christian a few questions about his research to facilitate a discussion that we hope will be interesting to you. Um, and you can put your questions in the chat and I will ask these um, to Christian. So if anyone has read Christian's work and has any burning questions or any questions come up during the discussion, please do pop them in the Q&A um, and I will ask those on your behalf. Um, so welcome Christian. And the first thing I'd like to ask you is if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself and your research journey for maybe those who haven't come across to your research before. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Ellen, for this nice introduction and for inviting me um, to, to speak in that um, keynote slot. So yeah, my name is Christian. Um, I'm on, I was born and raised in Germany and I currently work, live and work in the UK. So I'm a migrant in the UK. Um, I uh, teach sociology and I do interdisciplinary research at um, Manchester Metropolitan University. And yeah, I, I guess my life as an academic and my, you know, took off when I moved to the UK um, in the mid 1990s to do a postgraduate degree in gender and ethnicity studies. And um, I just would like to acknowledge some of my teachers. So um, some of um, our lecturers at the time, like Nira Yuval Davis, Floya Antias, and Elaine Unterhalte, um, who just produced um, amazing feminist, anti-racist, and socialist theory and activist work, um, really shaped, shaped um, my approach to, to social sciences. And yeah, later did a PhD uh, in the UK at the University of Essex. And I was um, supervised by um, Ken Plummer, who was also an amazing supervisor and taught me quite a lot about taking a non-judgmental approach to all kinds of um, histories of thought. And yeah, I did a PhD on consensual non-monogamy in gay male and bisexual um, social movement context. So that brought me into doing research on consensual non-monogamy. Um, yeah, I've done yeah, work on consensual non-monogamy, but also LGBTQI plus issues. Again, in Manchester Met, I worked a lot with um, John Binney, who's uh, yeah, um, um, influential queer theorist um, and researcher in human geography. And I've collaborated with other people more recently with uh, Daniel Cardoso on uh, comparative research on consensual non-monogamy activism. Um, yeah, maybe ask me a few more, a few more questions. Yeah, so um, obviously you've worked a great deal on LGBTQ plus topics and also on consensual non-monogamies. Um, I'd kind of like to know a bit about the um, political and conceptual questions that might have motivated your research over the years. I mean, you know, one of the um, guiding questions of my research into consensual non-monogamy when I started my PhD was um, to understand better the um, alternative and innovative approaches of people who live against the grain, who contest mononormativity, and um, yeah, who do that also in a kind of, let's say, um, 
politicized political way. So I did not just research um, intimate relationships. I researched them in the context of the discourses of social movements. So I was always a bit interested in, you know, how does how do politics, economic issues, and questions of the law intersect with the choices we make as individuals to live our relationships and with the strategies we may develop in order to yeah contest um, or or go along with these um, issues um, so yeah what were my objectives yeah to understand you know the kind of conditions for a politics around consensual non-monogamy, but also to understand the strategies um, of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender um, movements and other minoritized movements. Um, I've also always been interested in, let's say, the wider picture, also how, you know, sort of politics work in the context of uh, a transnational, the transnational sphere, how geopolitics, um, and also history, the histories of geopolitics, you know, such such as um, colonialism and um, different forms of um, empire have um, have influenced the sexual cultures we live in today. Yeah. Um, I now have a question kind of about how your own identity intersects with your research. Um, personally, I'm bisexual and I research bisexual parenthood and I mm. think there is an interaction between that, not only because that's why I became interested in that topic in the first mm. place, and I think a lot of researchers focus their research on things that is salient to their own identity, um, but also in terms of the way that I've gone about collecting and analysing my data, mm. I think has been hugely influenced by my own bi plus identity. Um, from during data collection, building rapport with participants, I would say it's much easier when you are bi plus and they are bi plus and you have that mm. identity in common. But also when I've analysed my own data, I think that I might be sensitised to certain aspects of the data um, because of my own identity and my own experiences but probably also desensitized to certain aspects of the data that I would um, consider taken for mm. granted knowledge and they're just within what I already know, so I wouldn't necessarily report on those findings. Do you think your own identity has had any impact on your research and your research um, mm. journey at all? I mean, thank you, Ellen. That's a really interesting and also quite complex um, question. And I think, yes, like for most researchers and in particular for most gender and sexuality research my identities um, mattered a great deal so I became interested in let's say consensual non-monogamy in the context of queer cultures because I myself um, was at the time and I still am a kind of person who um, is drawn towards consensual non-monogamy um, and um, who at the time was also living in a kind of, let's say, yeah, a more kind of complex relationship constellation. Um, and yeah, it's kind of quite interesting. My PhD research, which I started in the late 1990s, was originally conceptualized as a research into gay men in consensual non-monogamous relationships for various reasons. However, I always was kind of quite keen in to writing bisexuality um, into that project, um, among others, because I myself I identified as a um, bisexual person, a queerly minded, queer inspired um, bisexual person. So it kind of mattered for me on the on the level of um, identity. Um, and that kind of also kind of later on influenced the trajectory of my my research kind of quite significantly. So the let's say the element of bisexuality as as a kind of conceptual question, but also as a portion of the research was growing significantly over the years that I worked on that project. It's kind of quite interesting because I did research into you know gay male contexts and also into bisexual context. And of course, you could say in the bisexual context, you know, my bi identity may have 
worked as a, you know, something facilitating report, you know, we had something in common, you know, so, um, and um, certain histories, but also involvement into certain um, groups and communities. At the same time, I also did research in a gay male context. And it's kind of quite interesting because I found that initially um, also quite troubling because I always felt a bit, I felt that urge like I need to convey <laughs> I, I'm actually bisexual because I very often was read by my interview partners um, as, as, as a gay man, at least when I did research in the context of the gay male community. So, and I was at time also kind of quite anxious around these issues, um, even if my experiences were actually quite interesting and amazing. So the kind of conversations I had um, with, um, with gay men about bisexuality were, were quite, um, quite telling and interesting, you know, to, he to hear their thoughts and also to see how sexual identity issues I sometimes get kind of quite blurry and how, how life stories um, are kind of quite complex and so on. So basically what I wanted to say is you emphasized rapport. And I think, yes, you know, similarities in identity may cause rapport, but I think differences in identity also sometimes cause um, insecurity, mm -hmm. anxiety for us as researchers. And um, of course, I started talking about um, sexual identity, maybe because, you know, we're in a forum on, on bisexuality and on a bisexual research conference, but gender identity did matter for me as well. So I entered this research as um, a cisgendered male identified um, person. And I think that met, you know, that influenced the dynamics I had in interviewing um, um, bisexual women in the course of this research, but also in the dynamics um, doing interview with transgender people. Um, yeah, racial identities, ethnic identities, national identities, all this matter, depending on the context um, of um, the research. I give maybe one more example. Um, I wrote my master dissertation on um, the life story of a Jewish gay male activist who uh, was involved in um, setting up one of the first um, Jewish gay groups in Europe. And, um, you know, we had this kind of amazing conversations about the question of um, ethnic identity or Jewish identity in the context of his lifelong activism. But um, when we on one day and one of our conversations started discussing, you know, let's say politics in the Middle East, and we were not necessarily of the same opinion. Sort of, he he kind of quite quickly draw a line and and said, "Listen, you know, I would maybe discuss that issue with anybody else, but um, I'm I'm not prepared to you know discuss that issue um, with a German person." So it's kind of quite interesting how the history of fascism, the genocide, the Holocaust. Um, you know, surfaces and, 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 and structures, research environments, even in the context of th that I was sitting there talking to a friend of mine. So um, that's kind of quite complex when I did in, um, research in Central and Eastern Europe, in Poland, for example, you know, there's a, again, the history of German fascism has shaped um, European history. Um, and, you know, these issues still linger you know, these issues are not resolved, the structure, the discourse around gender and identity and sexual politics. So all I wanted to say is, yes, identities matters. They, in, we, we work them through in quite complex ways. It is important to be reflexive, but the most important insight I took away from all that is that whatever we do, our knowledge is always situated and it is partial and we should acknowledge that. Um, so I'm also taking a, a more reserved line with, towards um, the question of an objectivist, you know, detached um, research. Um, so I'm Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. I mean, this is my own personal positionality, but I always think that when I'm writing a, a report or writing up findings, those findings are 
what participants have decided to tell me, but they're not just an objective that the participants have decided to tell me, but it's my own mm. interpretation and my own analysis of what they've decided to tell me. But then what they've decided to tell me is their own interpretation of what happened. And if, I mean, we could get into a very long debate about mm. if there is a, mm. what actually happened or if it is their uh, own subjective experience that shapes what actually happened. Like that's a mm. different conversation. I think that's a really important thing to say about how identities affect our work and the importance of reflexivity. Um, I wanted to go back to something you said earlier mm. on about um, how your gender played a role when you were interviewing bisexual um, women. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about that and how you think that kind of shaped those interactions? I mean, uh, you know, one thing which was kind of quite, which mattered a great deal to me is, um, that originally um, I, I thought, I conceptualized my research about research into men because I thought that women were not necessarily interested in talking to me. So I had that kind of perception that, you know, gender difference um, would matter so much and would be so strongly politicized also um, so that it would translate into reservations on, on women's point of views. And I think my impression was very strongly shaped also by my personal, let's say, gender environments in, you know, just of living in Germany in the mid 1990s when separatist feminism was very strong in the kind of left wing communities I was based in which I think such a research would have been problematic. In the UK, um, that did not matter so much. And sort of, you know, um, bisexual women were quite upfront about it. I said, listen, you know, why do you do this research? Why don't you do, you know, why do you, do, you know, only research men? I'd love to participate. So actually there was a lot of, you know, rapport. Um, however, I think there were also, let's say, situations um, in which I think conversations may have had been different. So, for example, in some conversations, um, women interviewees also shared experience of sexual violence with me. I'm not necessarily sure to what extent, you know, my sort of, yeah, cisgender identity as a bisexual man also had an influence, um, you know, on, on, on these dynamics. Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about your book, The Spectre of Promiscuity. Um, so for those who don't know, um, this book makes a really important contribution to the sociological literature on sexual and intimate relationships and explores the diversity of gay male and bisexual relationship practices in the context of heteronorm a heteronormative society or heteronormative citizenship. And it highlights the complexity of power relations that circum circumscribe um, queer people's relationships and sexual lives. Um, can you tell everyone a little bit more about the book for those who haven't read it? Um, yeah, I, you know, this book is based on um, on um, my PhD research, and I was, you know, I'm very grateful that at the time. I received a sociological review research fellowship, which allowed me to, to write up that um, monograph. Um, at the time, I was also kind of based at um, Kiel University. The, the, the journal is based at Kiel University. And I had the privilege to work quite closely with scholars involved in the Center for Law, Gender and Sexuality which is not, does not matter so much for this particular book, but I think, you know, that kind of experience um, brought to the fore for myself the need to critically reflect about legal frameworks. Okay, the book itself, it is um, based on um, life history oriented interviews with um, gay men and, and bisexual men and women and also transgendered people um, who, um, who had experiences in, with consensual non-monogamy in their life course. So most of them currently were in non-monogamous relationships. Not all of them, some of them had broken up with their partners or their partners had recently died and so on. So and I think I just learned um, 
Well, I find quite striking also to see how people's um, approach to non-monogamy changes in the course of the life in the life course because um, maybe sort of I myself at the time I had such a strong investment in non-monogamy as an identity and um, I think a lot of young people do have that um, you know they are sort of full in for that but it's also interesting to see how for many people you know they're a you know, their approach changes, you know, as they go through life, they may meet partners with whom they can be non-monogamous and like to be non-monogamous. They may meet partners where they suddenly feel, no, um, that's not what I want, um, and so on. Or people's, yeah, people's ideas about that change even within the same relationship. So it, I, I, I found it interesting to see um, how, yeah, how we all know negotiation is a key um, element in uh, consensual non-monogamy, but just to see how that um, can be quite profound and um, can be a long-term project. And um, I found that kind of interesting. And what I became interested more and in more was the question of power around consensual non-monogamy. So in a, to a certain extent, I was interested in mononormativity, compulsory monogamy as a, as a regime of power and how that in mm -hmm. itself is intersectional to the extent that I'm, you know, dominant ideas about class and dominant idea about race also shape the space people have to be in consensual non-monogamous relationships or the way they are perceived when they are doing that. So I was interested in that kind of, let's say, external power relations, but I also was quite interested in, let's say, the internal power relationships and you know, how power structures um, these processes of negotiation and how power may shape the kind of limits of consent. Um, and yeah, to a certain extent, I was a bit kind of taken aback by the largely celebratory discourse about polyamory in particular, which was, you know, in, in most of the texts I encountered at the time just um, hailed as, you know, a sort of evolutionist path towards, um, yeah, um, a liberated um, society, you know. Um, sometimes that came from a sort of more, I would say, straightish, <laughs> consensual non-monogamy context, sometimes it came from explicitly bisexual polyamory discourse. Um, so I wanted to, to, to ask a few difficult, you know, difficult questions around, um, mm -hmm. um, around these issues. Because I think ultimately, yeah. many of our lives <laughs> are more complex as, you know, the glossy picture tells. So. Yeah, and so in that book, you kind of talk about gay and bisexual non-monogamies. Um, did you find any distinct differences between kind of the relationships that bisexual men, these non-monogamous relationships that bisexual mm. men were having compared to gay non-monogamous uh, non men? Sorry. Mm, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I did that research, you know, the, basically the, the bisexual population or participants in my research was comprised of people of different genders. It was not only men, um, but, you know, the, yeah, the gay sample was um, only men. Um, I would just, um, I think that within the kind of gay male context, there seems to be, seem to be a, a, a consensus that non-monogamy is what most gay men do. So, you know, people would say, listen, you know, if you ask me about my friends, I've got 80, 90 people in my address book, they are all in a non-monogamous relationship. Um, so in that sense, I feel like, um, so first of all, that was kind of taken for granted, um, even if sometimes, you know, sometimes it's all worked perfectly, but sometimes things were also kind of quite difficult around the involvement, you know, for example, with, you know, particular people, um, friends, is it okay to have a relationship with other friends or not, um, and so on. Um, or also, 
let's say, questions which are not necessarily tied towards different approaches of non-monogamy, but also towards people's um, different states of mind and um, states of mind and different um, social and economic situations. So for example, I remember now, I'm not even sure whether I talk about that in my book, the story of one um, elderly gay participant who, um, who told me that story that how the relationship was wonderful until his partner um, you know, started to become self-employed and his stress levels were kind of escalating and he was kind of started to excessively worry about his economic situation, um, started to feel insecure and how that kind of started to, you know, to, 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 to bring very toxic dynamics into their relationships and that was the end of it. So it's an issue actually, which is not necessarily tied to non-monogamy. Anyways, I'm, 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 I'm strolling off a bit. With regard to con you know, bisexuality, I found it interesting that, you know, again, the people who, the people who um, were close to bisexual community organizing um, all felt, yes, you know, bisexual community is kind of, you know, um, very supportive of consensual non-monogamy. Um, for them, that was not necessarily um, a big question. I even talked to some people who felt a bit like, you know, listen, yeah, we were non-monogamous, but then we decided to close down our relationship. Um, and then our life turned hell because, you know, all of our friends thought, you know, that's kind of completely wrong what you're doing. So some people would emphasize that even that normative pressure to, to mm -hmm. be polyamorous and there's not much space around it. If you're, in, if you're not doing that, then you're kind of, you know, buying into, you know, a kind of ideological deluded stance of compulsory monogamy. But I also felt that on the level of identity, that kind of non-monogamy thing seemed to matter more. So I, I always mm -hmm. feel a bit like that this whole kind of, this, you know, basically, um, you know, yeah, for example, if you, you know, attend bisexual um, conferences, you know, conventions, you would always have workshops about that. There's a great place of deb you know, debate about it. It's, um, it's an ongoing issue, not only about consensual non-monogamy, maybe also about marriage, maybe also about monogamy, um, but it's, um, yeah, it's more of an issue. And I think it's the same, more it's an identity issue. And I also think it's more important for bisexual people to create a political discourse that, leg that legitimizes um, non-monogamy. Again, maybe that is, I think this is partially related with um, the history of feminism and the, um, the always, let's say, um, that assumption that ultimately bisexual consensual non-monogamy to the extent that involves other gender slash other sex relationships may be shaped by an exploitative patriarchal <laughs> setup. So I think there's yeah. a bit like, you know, there's a stronger, let's say, engagement with feminist critiques of patriarchal power. Um, but yeah, also I think because in that kind of mixed gender context, if it's not explicitly clear, there's less of a sex positive consensus. So I think gay male communities have been, you know, very active, creative um, and, and, and successful in, in creating a, a relaxed culture <laughs> around, um, you know, um, sex with multiple partners, also including yeah. casual sex. I think that does not necessarily extend to, in this, to the same extent in, in the kind of to, to other sort of, yeah, you know, let's say um, sexuality community based. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I had a few more questions about your book. Um, so when you wrote the book, the law um, around same-sex marriage in the UK, it 
it's changed since you wrote the book mm. um, like first allowing civil partnerships between same-sex couples and now allowing marriage between same-sex or same gender couples um uh do you think that there needs to be more legal change um regarding consensual non-monogamy and plural marriage um i mean that's a very very interesting um question and um of course you know maybe if you, I hope you don't mind if I sort of say a, a few more sentences about same-sex marriage and civil partnerships first before sure. I go on to talk about uh, multiple marriage. So yeah, I conducted this research, you know, pr prior to to the introduction of the Civil Partnership Act and also later um, the Same-Sex Marriage Act. Um, my research was partially motivated by by that, let's say, historical context. <laughs> um, contextualization so i was interested what do non-monogamous people think about same-sex marriage and of course as a person who has been very strongly influenced um, by queer theory and also let's say by let's say the currents of bisexual theory which were strongly shaped by queer theory like the work of the bi-academic um, intervention um, I, I was kind of expecting people to say, no, marriage, we don't, we don't want marriage, you know, but that was kind of quite interesting that both in, you know, the kind of gay male, among my gay male participants, but also among my bisexual identified participants, there was a virtually, um, how would, how do you say? Um, Unanimous? Non yeah, anonymous support um, of, um, of, the marriage equality um, um, campaign. And uh, I found that interesting to see that even within a kind of, let's say, um, a consensual non-monogamy queer setup, that kind of liberal value of equal rights was so deeply ingrained. Um, um, okay. So that even people who felt like they never would profit or benefit from these laws they would never want to marry felt as a matter of principle that needs this change is necessary so there were a few people who would just say let's abolish marriage for example i found that interesting nowadays i think within the kind of wider let's say um political landscape of people who are concerned about consensual non-monogamy you've got much more people who would take an explicit anti-marriage stance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the kind of question of multiple marriage is kind of a tricky one. Um, personally speaking, I, um, I'm sort of not necessarily um, a fan of that idea to, um, to expand you know the institution um, of marriage to include and you know a certain number of other partners um, i kind of um, i'm more aligned with the legal study scholars who think that there is not necessarily uh, you know a one size fits all approach and that um, due to the patriarchal and also mononormative, but also the kind of class-based and racial legacies which shaped the institution of marriage and dominant ideas about marriage, I think it would be more productive to think about alternatives um, yeah, um, around, for example, um, along the lines of civil partnership acts or other kind of uh, statutory laws or contractual relationships, which may give a bit more, um, mm, yeah, maybe more um, dynamic and flexible in order to accommodate for, for the complex constellations of some um, consensual non monogamous relationships and multi-parent um, good um, relationships. I found it interesting how in your book you were talking, and as I said, obviously the book was written uh, before same-sex mm. civil partnerships or marriage were legal in the UK, and some of your participants were married to their other sex or um, mixed, they were in mixed gender mm. relationships and they'd become, they'd got married. Um, and then that, you spoke about how that introduced, in some cases, a hierarchy into those relationships, mm. um, making other partners feel like secondary partners, even if those two people who were married 
didn't think there was a hierarchical order within mm. their polyamorous or um, non non well, I can't speak today, non-monogamous um, constellation. I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that and about how perhaps allowing marriage only between two people might contribute to hierarchies mm. within um, non-monogamous relationship. I mean, I think you, you know, you summarized that point really, really well, but I had, yeah, um, a few conversations, in particular one conversations when I felt um, that, or when I didn't just feel it, but, you know, the person I interviewed was so explicit that, um, that he felt completely, um, yeah, degraded <laughs> in, in a relationship um, with a married couple who were also at the same time, you know, the parents, um, biological parents of their children. Um, so in, it's also interesting to see how the stages of marriage here ties and, and, and underrides a particular construct of biological kinship, which creates yet another layer of exclusion in a kind of polycule or kind of um, chosen family context. Um, so, yeah, I think the law does shape um, divisions. <laughs> it may create security for some, but it may um, yeah, create um, the sense of being excluded or, you know, or being particular um, yeah, particularly precarious and 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 um, if yeah, one is not included. Sorry, go ahead, Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had a question, kind of moving away from the plural marriage topic, um, but a question about kind of conceptualizing um non-monogamous relationships or non-monogamous identities, and whether, and you touch on this um in your book, and I found it in my own research that there seems to be a group of people who engage in um, polyamory or non-monogamy and mm. they see that as a, a lifestyle or a relationship choice or a relationship constellation. And then there's a separate group of people who see being non-monogamous or being polyamorous as part of their identity in the same way that they would um, consider something like bisexuality or maybe even their gender to be part of their identity. Um, I don't really know what my question is with this, but just kind of mm. have you, can you talk a little bit about those kind of two groups of non-monogamous people? I mean, yeah, I I think I understand what you mean. And I also observed in my research that, uh, yeah, people have very different ideas <laughs> um, and about consensual non-monogamy and why they want to be doing that. And I think for some people um, it is, it, 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 in the course of my research, it was very clear that that's what they are. So, you know, sort of some speculating that, you know, they may be born that way. I mean, MJ Barker has also done research about that and about these different, you know, narratives about um, consensual non-monogamy, a kind of deep wired identity, or maybe, uh, you know, a relationship choice. By the way, I'm not necessarily such a big fan of that kind of term lifestyle in the context of consensual non-monogamy or also other kind of, let's say, sexual practices, because it always sounds a bit kind of trivializing. So. <laughs> Um, um yeah the, for want um, of a better I, word like there are yeah, these yeah, two uh, yeah 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 so i'm yeah i like I w the language of choice i think I, I i would prefer or maybe also preference or or, or something like that but yeah it's, it's kind of interesting so people um do have um alternative accounts um so it is kind of um it is to a certain extent, you know, I would um, always accept, you know, um, and have respect to everybody's, um, let's say, explanation of how they feel, you know, about that particular kind of aspect um, of their identity. On the level of politics and the level of political strategy, I've always been a bit more wary of that, let's say, <laughs> Um, you know, I'm born that way type of argument. Um, 
because I think ultimately it narrows the um, the vision, <laughs> the political vision, because then, you know, um, the whole kind of uh, political objective is about, you know, creating rights for the people who are born that way. And, you know, that, and that very much aligns with, you know, a sexual orientation discourse, which is so strongly ingrained in anti-discrimination laws in different countries, but also in international human rights law. So to a certain extent, you know, from a pragmatic point of view, you could say, of course, yeah, let's use that sexual orientation discourse um, in order to advance rights for consensual non-monogamous folks. However, at the same time, I think um, I would always ask, but, you know, actually, whose lives can we understand and interpret, you know, um, through these concepts, who can really take recourse to that context? And I think that that um, cuts out a lot of people who are consensually non-monogamous. Um, you know, for example, I don't know. You know, um, people who are into swingers, uh, swinging, or, the, or um, also people who are kind of you know more drawn to casual and fleeting sexual encounters possibly having other partners, possibly not, and so on. So I think it's a bit kind of it's, um, I, it also forestalls a pot potential solidarity in coalitions um, with sex workers. I mean, sex workers are it's, it's kind of an interesting issue, but I think if I talk about consensual non-monogamy, I always think there should also be space to talk about sex work. I mean, people who who, who takes the view that sex work is always the effect of, you know, oppression and trafficking, of course, would not agree, but I think that is ultimately a, a simplified way of understanding the realities of sex work economies. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess I kind of asked the question because I was thinking about in the UK, we obviously have a law, we have protected characteristics that people can't be discriminated against based on the grounds of age or disability mm. or sexual orientation. And if we don't consider um, being non-monogamous to be an identity characteristic, I wonder if that prevents it becoming a protected mm. characteristic that people can be protected from discrimination based on. I mean, it possibly, you know, it, um, I would have to think that through more carefully, you know, within the context of, you know, um, the specifics of UK um, anti-discrimination legislation. Um, but I don't necessarily think that anti-discrimination laws do always have to take recourse to the question of identity or personal characteristics. That's true. Um, I mean, I also think you could also, um, you know, create legal protections um, against discrimination on the basis of practice, for example. And I like to think, I like to prefer to think about erotic sexuality as a form of practice rather than, you know, sort of um, advancing that kind of um, identity-based reasoning, always acknowledging that identities, of course, matter. Yeah, identities matter, but I think strategically inflating the identity element, um, yeah, may we always pay a certain price for that. And I think yeah, that's, that's a, a really a, good a, point. Reduction of the political vision, I think. So I think as we only have about 13 minutes left, I think there are some questions, um, if that's okay, from the audience. Yeah. So if Laura you could says, read them out, yeah, that's, that's oh, yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Laura thank says, you. Um, do you think consensual non-monogamy is becoming more well-known and popular in Western culture? Um, yeah, I think certainly. I mean, when I started my research, um, you know, of course, I knew that there's some such a thing as consensual non-monogamy. Also, that was not the term used at the time. Actually, in the 1990s, consensual non-monogamy had not yet been that kind of umbrella term. 
Um, we talked about non-monogamy full stop, I think, and most researchers did that. Um, and I encountered polyamory while doing my research. So, you know, I was not aware of that concept um, before. Um, so I think since the 1990s, um, there has been a massive an explosion, if you wanted it this way, of, you know, of, of groups, of um, news groups, um, internet, <laughs> business, publications, research on consensual non-monogamy. So I think, uh, yeah, uh, mu uh, much has happened. Um, mm, that does not necessarily in all contexts translate into an increase of acceptance, <laughs> you know, of um, consensual uh, non-monogamy as a way of life. So I think, you know, in many contexts, people still have to, to fight and struggle hard to, you know, to, um, yeah, to come to terms with um, hostilities within their communities, their neighborhoods, their workplaces, um, in, and institutions. So discrimination persists in some contexts more than others. But at the same time, I think um, supportive communities um, have grown. And I would suggest that the bisexual community and you know the bi temporary bisexual community spaces and events and groups have also played uh, an important role in, in, in supporting people in their alternative um, ways of life, if you want to think of it as an alternative. Yeah. I hope. And you were talking about, sorry, go ahead. I hope that answers that question, yeah. Yeah, you were talking about kind of the change in terminology over time. And obviously we've been using the terms non-monogamy and polyamory. Um, Maybe there's some people who aren't so familiar with the different, I guess, the ins and outs of um, these different types of non-monogamies. Um, that might be something that people might be interested in, if you could maybe de delineate those slightly. Um, I mean, there's... Um... I think nowadays the term consensual non-monogamy, as I said, like is a kind of an umbrella term used for different ways of building non-monogamous relationships, which ultimately are based on a shared knowledge, the shared knowledge of all who are participating in that kind of context, that this arrangement is, at least potentially, for all or for some, non-monogamous and also which is kind of built on an ongoing process of working these things out um, so but yeah polyamory is probably nowadays the most you know let's say famous um, well-known kind of form of consensual non-monogamy usually referring to um, people who have loving relationships with multiple people. Loving relationships may or may not be sexual. So this is an element for um, you know, sexual non-monogamy within most definitions of polyamory as well. Then there's also relationship anarchy, a term which you know I think became very popular um, since 2006 um, when um, Nordgren published a, a, a short blog, a manifesto, a short pamphlet on that issue, um, which is a way to think about um, relationships in a completely different way. And it's kind of an, a way to de-emphasize any distinction between a sexual relationship and a non-sexual relationship and a love relationship and a non-love relationship. So um, yeah. I think swinging, I probably don't have to explain. It's usually a couple-based um, activity um, where people, people swap partners or, you know, and join, you know, sex work, it's not sex works, um, public sex parties and so on. Um, I mean, then you may have, um, what else? <laughs> Ellen, yeah, help me. yeah I, I think that kind of covers some main ones. Poly, sure you know, polygamy things. would be an interesting question here. You know, I think I mentioned it, you know, um, which would refer to, um, let's say, probably more formalized forms of, um, of non-monogamy. Um, 
and many forms of polygamy. I think as you most or all are aware are also, um, you know, sort of based in, in based in certain faith traditions um, and, you know, within polyamory kind of communities, there always has been a strong, let's say, um, uh, emphasis on the distinction between polyamory and polygamy because you know poly polygamy very often is also seen as a potentially kind of um, non-consensual um, patriarchal setup in particular in the form of uh, polygyny in, in in which sort of faith-based polygynies in which one man may have you know may be able to marry several women and so on um, it's a kind of a quite a tricky question to see, you know, yes, that may be a cultural practice. I may not necessarily agree, agree with a sort of gender-based um, exclusion. Yeah, that's certainly not my point. At the same time, I also find it difficult to necessarily label all forms of polygyny um, as non-monogamous from the start, as, as, as non-consensual from the start, if, if, if you get me on that point. So, um, so I think to a certain extent, we may also want to think about the position of certain forms of polygamy or polygamy within the context of consensual non-monogamy. Yeah, we have one more question in the chat just before we wrap this session up. Um, so, uh, Laura says, do you think living a non-monogamous life openly could be the next type of coming out, like how people come out with sexuality? I mean, um, yes, you know, let's put it this way. Uh, it's a good question. I think for many people, um, consensual non-monogamy is a matter of coming out. But it's not necessarily this, the next one. I, I, mean, I was just thinking about one conversation I had with one of my research partners when I did that uh, UK-based research in the early 2000s. Um, it was a bisexual woman, and, and um, you know, she she just emphasized that you know, for her, being non-monogamous, that was kind of clear. Yeah. So sorry. Um, no, I'm, I'm mixing it up now, actually. I'm getting <laughs> lost in my memory. Um, no, actually, yeah. Um, sorry. I can't tell. Was it the story, other way around? Was it? The, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, it was the other way yeah. around. I think I, I'm, I'm kind of misremembered that story. But yes, I think um, non-monogamy um, can be a challenging coming out issue. Yes, like other issues as well, sort of, I think, you know, that kind of question of gender choice is not necessarily the own, only issue which, you know, which may, which we may understand through the concept of coming out. There's also questions of, you know, kink, for example, kinky involvement, which may be a distinctive aspect of coming out, if that's what people are into or if what you are into. Um, then also, you know, coming out is also a lang language which is referred to gender transitioning. Um, so there, yeah, there are sort of multiple aspects of coming out and consensual non-monogamy is certainly one, I guess. Um, so for example, in the literature on parenthood and, you know, sort of in consensually non-monogamous context, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, how to actually parent parents um, um, manage the communication of their non-monogamy to their children. And I, I read your article, Ellen, on bisexual motherhood. You know, that's a similar issue. You know, how do you communicate your bisexuality um, if you're in a sort of monogamous type of relationship? But many non-monogamous relationships, if they involve biological pair-based parenting, are also read as by an as, as monogamous, sometimes by the children themselves. So yeah. an interesting case of coming out. So yeah, sorry. some of my participants were in polyamorous relationships and um, some had told their children that they were polyamorous or that they had multiple partners and some hadn't. And sometimes um, new partners joining that relationship 
was a motivation for some of the bi plus mothers in my study to actually broach this conversation about their own bi plus identity with their children to kind of say mm. oh mummy's getting a new boyfriend or mummy's getting a new partner um and that kind of opened up that discussion about their bi plus identity but also about being non-monogamous so i think sometimes those relationships um go hand in hand and mm. those conversations go hand in hand rather sorry But it is yeah. a minefield thinking about how to explain um, bisexuality to children or how to explain non-monogamy mm. to children. And I think the fact that um, a lot of adults in society have problems understanding non-monogamy mm. and bisexuality. Mm. So I think once you're trying to explain that in very simplistic terms to children who obviously mm. haven't had relationships, it, it is quite difficult to do that. Yeah, by the way, Maria Palotta Chiaroli wrote an excellent novel on that kind of question of uh, a kind of novel for adolescents, which is also about, um, yeah. Um, and we definitely of, need representation yeah. in children's books or in adolescent yeah, books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really helpful for explaining these concepts to young people. Mm. Do we have are time there... for any other questions or mm. are we? <laughs> I can't see any further questions in the Q&A or the chat box. So should we wrap this up here? Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for talking to me today, Christian. It really has been a pleasure. And I feel like we've touched on so many different topics, but we could be here for hours um, asking more things and mm. broaching more topics. But thank you so much. I think yeah, it was really very delightful to talk to you. And yeah, thank you again for, you know, giving me that privileged <laughs> space to talk about my ideas and my research. So. Thank you.